Hello, everyone. Um, hopefully, well, I mean, everyone here, I'm sure understands, but you'll have various children. Um, I'm at my sister's house at the moment. Um, so welcome, everyone, to this birth sharing circle. Uh, my name is Laura Pasco. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of the Doula Support Foundation. Um, and one of the amazing parts of that role is that I've had the privilege of watching um, Jose, the creator of the birth story writing contest, build and expand this um, contest in the birth sharing circle that we're here for today um, over the last three years. And it's just been such an incredible thing to witness, to see the incredible people that we bring in and the stories we hear. So I just want to start out by uh, just noting how amazing it is to have um, someone with a vision that makes something like this happen. And, and just thank you, Jose, for, for making all of this um, come to be. Um, so for those of you who, um, who have never attended one of these, um, especially welcome and just know that you're in for a treat. Um, I've been at um, each one of these that we've done thus far and every time it's incredibly moving. Um, it's, um, it's just a really profound experience and that is thanks to the talent, the creativity and the courage of all of those who are sharing their stories with us today. So just thank you for being here. Um, before we jump in, I want to uh, just begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the land that we are on today. Uh, while we meet today on a virtual platform, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands, as well as the injustices that have occurred and continue to occur uh, to those who originally inhabited these lands, which we all call home. Um, so I am currently in Lenape Hoking, or the land of the Lenape, which today is known as Brooklyn, New York, uh, but is the traditional and unceded territory of the Lenape. Um, and I would like to pay my respects to Indigenous elders, past, present, and future, um, and to those who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Um, I would now like to hand it over to Chelsea, uh, who will tell you all a bit more about the Dual Support Foundation, so you can get to know us a bit more uh, and know where your donations are going to um, as part of uh, joining this birth sharing circle. So just thank you, because um, you know every dollar really matters to our ability to provide these much needed services that we've seen even a, a much greater need in, in the COVID times um, for folks along their pregnancy journey. So just thank you everyone for being here and for all of your generous donations. So Chelsea, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Oh. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. I am the current chairperson of the Doula Support Foundation, okay, uh, which is the umbrella organization for a few different programs. Um, and one of those programs, although it is under us, it is entirely Jose's baby. Um, and that is the birth sharing circle um, that we have today and that we've had for the last couple of years. Um, the Doula Support Foundation basically grew out of a bunch of doulas coming together and trying to think of ways to make doula care more accessible and to remove a lot of the barriers um, for birth support and birth empowerment that we can provide. Um, we have kind of expanded past the Kingston bubble and we're now all the way from Trenton into Brockville, but we're hoping to continue that expansion. We have a lot of different programs, um, but one of our kind of core missions as the Doula Support Foundation is that advocacy, that encouraging self-advocacy, um, that empowerment of the birth experience, but also the empowerment of sharing it and processing it um, after you experience that birth. So this birth sharing circle fits so well into our kind of core mandate as Doula Support Foundation. And we just love supporting this uh, every year and every time it happens, it's so special to us. Um, like any foundation, we exist off of donations and um, fundraising. So if you feel so led, uh, feel free to visit our website at doulasupport.org. We have a big donate button on that one, or feel free to reach out to us personally, just at our email at info at doulasupport.org. And we can answer any questions um, and go from there. So yeah, that's just a little spiel about kind of who we are and why we're here doing this. Um, every year we do this, I always cry. There's tissues right next to me. We all have <laughs> our own ways of processing these stories and I'm so excited to hear the ones here today. Um, so yes, thank you so much everyone for being here, whether you're talking and participating or just listening and experiencing and supporting, feel free to reach out in the chat with any comments or questions you have. We may not answer it at the time, but I'll be monitoring them and I'll pass them along to whoever needs to answer those questions. Okay, so thank you so much. And I will pass it off to Mitzi to talk a little bit more about specifically what's happening today. 
Um, uh, yes, I just want to say thank you again for joining us on this very spooky Saturday. Um, I'm Mitzi, and I'm honored to be here with all of you courageous uh, creators. I'm also a board member of DSF, but relatively new to the foundation. Um, I had the pleasure of being a reader for this round of stories. Uh, I'm also a mother of three. And after my birth, um, I decided to write the stories and speak them via podcast. And um, I can say that, that that sharing of my experience with others significantly helped me um, with my healing journey. And from what I understand, that's a good part of the intention behind the original concept for this contest, that the stories, um, that, that through story, we can hope to create a more positive and inclusive birthing culture for as many people as possible. Um, and this, year's, uh, this year, the writers take us all the way back to 1979, which incidentally is the year I was born, and all the way forward to today. So those 40 odd years span a significant timeline of birthing and uh, feature many aspects of that world at once highlighting how far we've come with compassionate care and also how far we have yet to go to get to a more inclusive and peaceful birthing culture. And with each, within each story, I noticed the unmistakable moment uh, commented on of transition the climax of struggle, the point where even the most adamant non-drug taking birthers give it a second thought. Uh, that moment uh, in time that reminds us transition, change is hard, but we now know the love that awaits us on the other side. So um, having said that, I would now like to introduce to you Karen Lawford, who is going to speak on maternity care and Indigenous community. Hello, and thank you so much for the introduction and for including me in this year's events. I'm just, let's see, what can I tell you? I am uh, Anishinaabe midwife from Treaty 3 area in between Laxul First Nation and Pekanjikum First Nation in quite the middle of nowhere. My family, um, sorry, let me just start my timer because I, I don't want to take up all the time here. Um, my family lived in quite a remote um, way of being. I'm actually the first generation to not be born on the land in our community. So my mother was born on the land. Um, and so our contact with white settlers was quite recent compared to areas like Kingston where it has been for centuries. Um, and my, my grandmother, Makukum, was also a midwife. And I think that was out of necessity because they needed someone to actually learn how to deliver babies when there weren't, like, and they were the caregivers. So knowing how the mechanics of um, pregnancy and birth, um, and, and of course, labor and birth, and also the medicines related to it so that our people could survive. Um, and I think that's something that we are fortunate to not have to think about very often is that we survive childbirth and we survive labor. And I'm so thankful for those caregivers who have dedicated their lives to doing that work. And I know that there are people who have had horrible experiences with some caregivers, midwives included. And I'm also should say that I'm also a midwife, a registered midwife in Ontario. Um, I don't practice at this moment. So we all have work to do as care providers to properly provide services um, to people who come to us for care. Um, one of the, oh, I should also mention, <laughs> I'm a professor at, uh, assistant professor, yeah, assistant professor at Queen's University in the Department of Gender Studies, and my area of research is related to maternity care provided to those who live on reserves, so First Nations, and especially in relation to Health Canada's evacuation policy, which requires people who are pregnant um, it, late in their pregnancy in their third trimester to actually travel out of the community. So being evacuated out routinely to birth in Southern urban uh, tertiary care hospitals. So Kingston does in fact receive um, First Nations and Inuit from up North to await to go into labor and then give birth and then go back home. So there's a severe, significant disconnect between um, where care is provided and where it should be and where people want to have their care provided. And I know that's not just the case for maternity care, but that's an area that I'm really interested in because for um, First Nations people and Inuit, again, the literature related to uh, Métis peoples is not well-developed at all. So 
I can only speculate that it's exactly the same, is that if you were, you're forced to leave your community, your home. And I remember being part of, um, I should warn you that sometimes I, when I have strong feelings, the tone of my voice changes or I yawn and it's just a response to stress. And I was sitting next to this physician up, up in uh, Northern Ontario, like quite North, and I don't mean Barry, I mean North, North of Sudbury. And he proudly told me that he called the police because a woman, and in this case, it was a woman who she was pregnant and she wouldn't get on that plane to be evacuated out to the Southern area. And so she was um, escorted onto the plane in handcuffs and she's pregnant. And this is literally what people think is appropriate. And, and I was just astounded, of course. And, and people don't want to, they want to give um, birth in their homes, in their communities, and with their families. I know there are some people who do want and need to for medical reasons, such as let's say you've had three cesarean sections. I think probably everyone here would agree that that fourth delivery should be a section in a high level hospital, not even in a, a prime a level one hospital. But the routineness of it is really harming us all because what's happened then is we're losing healthcare providers who can deliver babies because these rural and remote um, maternity care units are being closed. So this is not just an issue for Indigenous peoples. This is an addition, This is an issue for all of Canadians. So we need to pay attention, I think, to where maternity care is provided, who provides it, and how we want it provided. Because right now, we're not doing that decision makers as uh, people who service, who um, access that service. Um, and so in some ways, this is about, my, my talk is about I'm wanting to bring attention to how Indigenous peoples are affected. And definitely it's related to colonialism, white supremacy, Christianity, in terms of assimilating and civilizing Indigenous people. Um, because of course, um, genocide didn't work as well as the Canadian government had hoped through their tools like Indis Indian Residential School, 60s Scoop and the ongoing Millennial Scoop. These are things that we have to come to terms with as integral and affecting the way maternity care is provided now. And I want there, definitely my research is focused on um, First Nations and Indigenous peoples broadly within this country, but I really am concerned that we're not listening to people who are requesting care and the lack of choice and services within maternity care. We know that maternity care saves people's lives. We know that there's a certain minimum standard of prenatal visits and postnatal visits and who should be at the birth and the minimum training for that. And when I, and I understand that people leave, um, choose to have unattended births because of the legitimate fears that they have of encountering a healthcare system that seems to be losing its sense of humanity. And I fear for that. And so the stories that were shared, um, just to bring it back to where we are right now, they are all relevant. There isn't one iconic birth story. And this is where it's challenging as readers. Um, it's never to denigrate someone's experience, but I want you to know that every one of you has made an impact and affected and will influence how we view birth and all the varieties of birth. Um, I just have one more story to tell. I remember when I was in midwifery school, um, we had this, this textbook about people's experiences of birth and it was very woman centered. So second wave feminist work. And one of the pictures was this woman and she was just kind of hanging outside and she was smoking. And that's the reality. Some people smoke in pregnancy. Some people use substances that are not the best, but we need to support people without our own judgment, clouding our ability to provide care in a good way. And I really hope that all of you are somehow um, healed. That's not the best word, but you feel listened to because your stories are legitimate and they really do need none of us to legitimize it. But I hope that you know that you were heard and listened to through your story sharing. And I do want to thank you so much from that for that work and that trust in us. So get you make much. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, okay, so um, before we get right into the stories, um, I invite you to join me in a grounding exercise just to, in an effort to center our focus um, together into an open and deep listening place. Um, 
that we can create an energy of holding space for our sharers. And um, even though we may not be physically together, uh, your focus and participation is palpable. Uh, so please make sure you're comfortable. Um, I invite you to find something physical to ground you uh, into your space. I'm holding a rose quartz, which um, had we maybe been um, together, I we maybe would have passed um, while we shared um, with the love crystal. And um, so, yeah, if you could all if you get comfortable and I invite you to close your eyes if you're comfortable to do that and just take some deep breaths, just uh, sort of unifying in inhalations and exhalations. Just allowing your body to expand and broaden in your spatial awareness. And I invite you to open your heart into that space. Just taking some deep breaths all the way down into your diaphragm. Deep inhalation. And when you exhale, exhaling everything out. And when you're ready, please open your eyes and join our circle. Uh, like Chelsea said, there is a chat option at the bottom of your screens um, if you, uh, as a mean to offer, means to offer support, as well as if you have any questions. Um, so we're going to begin our stories with Karen Clark. Um, she grew up in rural Newfoundland the ancestral home of the Beothuk and now lives in Mount Pearl, Newfoundland with her husband and son. She is a social worker interested in the connection between maternal health and population well-being, and currently works as a policy analyst. She loves to write and is working toward writing being a more prominent part of her life. All right, bring me, um, you know, every now and then you come across a group of people where you go, oh, I found my people. Um, so this is one of those situations where I'm sitting here going, oh, how lucky I am that I found my people again. Uh, it happens every now and then. So as was mentioned, I grew up in rural Newfoundland and I live in Mount Pearl, which is the sister city to our capital here in Newfoundland, Labrador, St. John's. And I've worked as a social worker for 14 years and um, worked directly with uh, many mothers in crisis and uh, then became a mother myself. <laughs> and I had to um, work very hard to find the people and the champions here in my local community to help me have an empowered birth pro uh, experience. And it was quite a struggle from day one to find any positive anything really, any positive stories, any positive kind of encouragement. Um, and I uh, really had to uh, have a, a strong faith in myself and um, really find people who were willing to encourage me. And that's where the role of my doula really played central in my pregnancy because she is one of those champions in our province. Jillian Hand is her name. Uh, and uh, she was one of those champions in our province for empowered births and um, she worked with me throughout my pregnancy and I have uh, her and my doctor to thank for allowing me, this sounds strange because why would anybody need to allow me to have the birth that I wanted to have but that's certainly the way that it felt. So here in Newfoundland and Labrador I gave birth in 2017 and there is no midwifery program here. Um, there is one that is just being established now but only in uh, one uh, city in the province, this Gander, Newfoundland, where they have a midwife program that's starting with the intention of having it expand across the province. <clears throat> and to the point of um, Karen Laufer's comments, we have a, a very substantial Indigenous population here in our province as well, particularly in Northern Labrador. Um, and the issues related to access to all health care, and especially maternity and infant care, is very prevalent here in this province as well. And so just one last comment about me finding my people. So aside from having, you know, similar values around birth, being a social worker and working with, uh, with mothers, uh, I currently work with uh, the government as policy analyst, but working with the Nazi government, which is the Inuit um, government in Labrador, uh, to help uh, 
action some items around improving services to children, youth, and families in those territories. So uh, lots of reasons for me to be the connector with the Tula Support Foundation, I'm starting to think. Anyways, I'll get to my story. Um, I was an honorable mention, and I thank you very much. Um, I've been writing ever since I was very young. It's one of those things that I started as kind of a private way to cope with my own uh, childhood uh, trauma, mental health challenges. And that is stuck with me my whole life, right to this day. And in my uh, most recent years, I've been trying to be more open about my writing because I really enjoy it and um, feel like it's something that I should start sharing. So this contest was right up my alley. It was almost like it was made for me. <laughs> um, and the inspiration for my story really came from that habit of writing through um, grief and trauma. So I had had a miscarriage before I had um, my pregnancy that resulted in my son. And the way that I coped with that grief was by writing letters to the baby. And so that's why I chose the kind of structure that I chose for my short story, which is a letter to my son. So uh, the name of the story is Let Me Tell You About Your Birth. And so I, once I saw the birth story uh, contest, I said, I'm going to sit down, read through those letters that I wrote and kind of have this be kind of a, I don't know, like an appendix <laughs> to, to all those letters to say, let me tell you about how you were eventually born. So I don't have time to read the whole story, but I figured what I would do is read the very last um, piece of it. So the very end of the story. It shouldn't take me too long. Just let me bring it up. <clears throat> and of course, if you're interested in reading the rest of the story, it is on the website, so you can see how we got to the point. And this is, I do believe, uh, describing that transition point that Mitzi spoke about. And I uh, also just want to let you guys know that my email address is uh, with the story as well. So if anybody is interested in connecting with me, uh, I'm always up for like a Zoom coffee date or anything like that. Uh, very much would welcome anybody to contact me. <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> here we go. So an hour later, I was breathing heavily and moaning loudly, bent over the hospital bed as the sensations took over my body and becoming more intense every minute. Your dad rubbed my back and chanted with me. The only way out is through. The only way out is through. The only way out is through. <laughs> we had agreed that if I wanted drugs, I would say the address of my first apartment. 293 Freshwater Road. As a side note, I, I actually want, I had the whole mailing address because I wanted to make sure when I was going to say it, I was going to say it all. <laughs> no one would question it and I would be given the drugs. I labored standing up in different positions until I reached eight centimeters. I was exhausted and the contractions were now on top of one another. My legs buckled as each new contraction made my body jerk forward against the bed. The only thing my mind could now conjure was 293, 293, 293. I whispered the numbers under my breath. My doctor Kelly finally arrived. She had been delivering another baby and hadn't seen me since I was wishing for contractions to start. Kelly burst through the room and announced, look who's finally having contractions. I'm so happy for you. She was grinning so hard, her eyes nearly closed under the pressure of her cheeks as she smiled. Still bent over the bed, I let my head rest on the mattress and I smiled with her. Let's get her on the bed and see how she does, Kelly instructed, observing my quivering legs. I laid on my side, naked, with my legs in a flamingo pose. Your dad held the buckled leg in place. From then on, I made no noise. I closed my eyes and I saw nothing but stars. My doula Jillian squeezed my hand under the pillow and whispered in my ear. All other sounds were a distant muffle as I surrendered to your instructions. After 53 minutes of pushing, you arrived at 4.08 p.m., nearly 30 hours after my water had broken. The pain evaporated and I burst into tears as Kelly placed you on my chest. Your hair was matted with blood, and I could feel the warm coil of the umbilical cord draped over my upper thigh and along my side. I gazed into your eyes, feeling strong, as a rush of oxytocin and endorphins enveloped us. The end. So that's my story, guys. Thanks for letting me share it. Thank you so much, Karen. 
Okay, um, so I'll now introduce Laurie Sebastianuti, who was one of our readers. Um, Laurie is a writer and a teacher from Stony Creek, Ontario. She placed second in the Doula Support Foundation's 2020 birth story co contest. And her essays have appeared in the Hamilton Review of Books, the New Quarterly, and the Humber Literary Review. Uh, Lori. Um, thank you to Jose and the organization for inviting me to be a reader. It was an amazing experience. I'm really happy to introduce Ruth Daniel and her story, New Seasons. I'll read her bio and then I'll talk a little bit about the impressions that her story made on me as a reader. Ruth Daniel is a writer and editor. Her first full-length collection of poems, The Brightest Thing, Caitlin Press, 2019, explores fairy tales and the contemporary search for happily ever after. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree, honors in English literature and writing from the University of Victoria, and a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing from the University of British Columbia. She lives with her husband and two young children in Kelowna, BC. Um, New Seasons, an honorable mention story, uh, is really a beautiful weaving, not just of literal seasons, a changing from spring to summer and from fall to winter, but from her first birth to her second birth, from uh, pregnancy to childbirth, and really um, it's a birther transformed in this process. So it's a lovely lyrical piece and I'm, I'm happy that you're all gonna hear some of it or all of it today. So Ruth, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much for that introduction and for everyone at the Doula Support Foundation for this contest and for this space. I'm going to read directly from the piece. It's called New Seasons. And it does go back and forth between two chronologies. So I go back and forth from the, the birth of my daughter, my first, and the birth of my son, my second. Um, it should be relatively clear when you're hearing when I'm switching the timelines, um, because there's season, seasonal markers. <laughs> one's happening in the fall and one's happening in the spring. New seasons. It's impossible to think about the birth of my first baby without thinking of the birth of my second or about the second birth without thinking of the first. Each birth gestures toward the other, time bending to look backwards and forwards. Each birth happened at the end or beginning of a new season, autumn into winter, spring into summer, life as I knew it and life as I didn't. Oh, just a little bit emotional. Um, Halloween day. So it's my daughter's birthday in just two days. <laughs> so it's my, the anniversary of me laboring. On Halloween day, 2017, I wake up feeling different. I can't explain, but I know the baby will come soon. I tell my husband to go to work. I am fine. Nothing is happening yet. And he's coming home early today anyhow to take me for my standing prenatal appointment at four o'clock. We stand at the back patio door. He gives me a kiss and then speaks to my belly. I love you, baby. Hurry up, baby. I slide the patio door shut and click the lock in place. The house is quiet and empty. I'm rarely alone like this. We're staying with my parents, but they're out of town. My body is full of a tight, tingly sensation. I want to describe as a kind of light, but also a heaviness, a deepness, a darkness in my abdomen. We have an agreement we will do this together, my baby and me. After lunch, I lie down for a nap with an overwhelming sense of contentment, feeling the baby kicking inside me. I have no doubt, no questions at all, about what I want and what I will do. I want a baby. I will give birth. On the last day of April, 2019, I wake after a night of fitful sleep. Overnight, contractions came and went. By 6 a.m., I'm too excited to try to sleep. I wake my husband. We're going to have a baby today, I say. He rubs my belly and grins. I call my parents to tell them too. We live in our own house now and they'll care for our daughter when it's time for the hospital. I wait for our daughter to wake and then I nurse her. 
I take a blurry selfie that shows me laughing, my brown hair messy and long across the pillow, and my daughter's brown curls on the back of her head, her face obscured from the photo as she latches her mouth onto my nipple. I have a beautiful baby, and I am about to have another. When I wake up from my afternoon nap on Halloween day and waddle to the bathroom, I become suspicious that my waters have broken. There is no exciting gush like in the movies, but the fluid filling the pad inside my underwear is more than just a bloody show. I call my husband and ask him to come home and install the car seat before our appointment. I have a feeling that once we leave the house, we won't be coming back until we have a baby to put into it, into that car seat. Our doctor confirms that my waters have broken. I take my husband, I ask my husband to take off his Spider-Man costume before we go to the hospital, but I still wear the tank top onto which I've painted a pumpkin over my belly and am gratified when the nurses chuckle at it. It's a beautiful sunny spring day and warm. So when my labor stalls, my husband and I walk past our neighbor's magnolia tree and take our daughter to the park. I watch my husband take our daughter on the slide she sits on his lap and grins and giggles. The sun pours through the leaves on the big trees and the ground is dappled with gold light and shadow. I wonder if a new baby will come today after all, or if they're waiting. But then I'm surprised by a contraction that's strong enough to make me glad to lean on the park's chain fence. I lean into the feelings too, into the shadow, into the light. No part of me is afraid. I'm not afraid of childbirth. After an anxious first trimester repeating the statistics of miscarriage to myself, I've since been looking forward to labor and birth. I'm more curious about what contractions will feel like than afraid. When pain comes, I am focused, pleased. I can do this. I lean into my husband, the smell of him immensely satisfying, and I'm aware that I'm an animal, that there is something distinctly primal about birth. Because my waters have broken prematurely, and we don't know how long ago I started leaking. And because I've tested positive for strep B, I'm given antibiotics and picotin to hurry labor along and reduce the risk of infection to the baby. I thought this might bother me with all my hopes of an unmedicated birth, but I've gone into labor naturally and the synthetic hormones are only augmenting something already happening. I decline pain medication and labor progresses well. I feel strong. I get the urge to push. I tell the nurse, who tells me that the doctor isn't here yet, and to wait a couple more contractions before pushing. Baby is so low in my pelvis that they're worried the baby will be born before the doctor can arrive to catch them. I hold on to the nurse's promise that I only need to wait for a couple more contractions. After two contractions have gone by, I ask if the doctor is here. No. I endure two more contractions, and I point out that I've gone through double the number of attractions the nurse had said. Just hang on a bit more, the nurse says, who must know she's asking the impossible but is asking it anyway. I moan. I dig my head so deeply into my husband's shoulder, breathing hard into his neck that it almost bruises him. We settle into the delivery room to have our second baby. As soon as the nurse comes by to introduce herself, I tell her, Please call the doctor and tell her that I've checked in and I'm going to have my baby. I don't want to wait for her this time. The nurse seems surprised and laughs, but I make her promise. I already feel that heaviness low in my pelvis, I explain. I'm going to want to push soon. When she returns, I ask her if she called the doctor. Yes, I did. Is she on her way? Well, she wasn't going to when I told her the patient progress report, but then when I said her, your name, she left right away. I laugh. I keep laboring. I once again bury my face into my husband's shoulders and neck, breathing in the smell of him. No induction to speed along the labor this time, but everything is faster than it was before. The nurses check my dilation and tell me there's still a bit of cervix in the way and it's not time to push yet. I know that sometimes pushing before you're fully dilated can bruise the cervix and make it swell shut and slow down the process. But I also know that I must push. I'm amazed I managed not to push when I was in labor with my daughter. This urge is irrepressible. I cannot help pushing. I do. The nurse checks me again and confirms my pushing has safely moved the rest of the cervix out of the way. I'm fully dilated. 
It's time to push now. I told you so, I shout, annoyed. I'm hot and sweaty and I'm ready to meet my second baby. I check the clock inside the delivery room. It's no longer Halloween. While I labored, the hands on the clock pushed past midnight. It's November now. The doctor arrives and I'm so relieved to be allowed to push. Pushing is the only thing. It's the totality of my experience. It's what I need to do, I push. The sensation of bearing down is unlike anything else I've ever experienced, but I don't feel any pain. I am so grateful to push, push, push. It feels good to push. The nurses were right about the timing. It doesn't take long. After 15 minutes, the doctor is saying, yes, very soon now, just a couple more pushes and we'll have a baby. And I hear her voice again, a moment later, incredulous. Do you know you're smiling? And I think, of course I'm smiling. You just told me I'm about to meet my baby. I've never seen a laboring woman smile while her baby is crowning, the doctor says. I don't have time to wonder about that observation much because then I am reaching down and feeling the top of my baby's head and her clump of wet, dark hair. My baby, she's here. My waters still haven't broken, unlike my labor with my daughter. Every baby is different and precious. My babies will be different and precious. The doctor asks for my consent to break my waters and I feel a gush of warmth between my legs. It's time to push. The baby's head emerges and I feel an intense sensation that I recognize as the ring of fire that the pregnancy books describe. This is the moment in which I was smiling while my daughter was born, but I'm not smiling now. My baby's head is born, but his shoulders are stuck. I won't know this until much later, but shoulder dystocia can become an emergency within about a minute because once the head is born, the baby needs oxygen. Right now, all I have is the fleeting impression that my best isn't good enough. I'm reminded to push hard for the full duration of each contraction, and I'm surprised by the reminder. I push. Someone presses a discreet button, and suddenly a half a dozen extra nurses are in the room, and my husband is frightened, and the nurses are holding my legs, pushing them back near my shoulders. One nurse is on top of me, pushing down on my belly, and the doctor is fiercely alert. I realize that my baby's life might depend on how hard I can push, but there is no time to worry. Instead, I push. I put all my energy into pushing and he is born. I'm holding my newborn daughter in my arms. I don't know it yet, but the weather is turning outside. It was autumn when we arrived at the hospital, but the season's first snowfall comes as I hold her. I look at my baby's wonderful face, bruised a little from birth, feel her small weight on me, and I think I'm definitely willing to do that again. I'm already sure that I will do that again for another baby. I'm holding my newborn son. I don't know it yet, but when we bring him home from the hospital, spring will have ended. Like his sister before him, he has ushered in a new season. Summer comes early and we'll spend the next few weeks in the garden. I'm delighted that my son has blonde hair. I'm astounded that my body produced someone with such different coloring than me and that he is a boy. When my daughter was crowning and I reached down and felt her hair, I knew somehow it was a dark hair like mine. That made sense. But my son makes a wonderful sense too. Like his sister, he'll be like and unlike me. My dear baby. I hold him while the doctor stitches me up. It takes ages, almost two hours, because his shoulders tore me open. My tailbone, too, broke with the force of his arrival. It is a common childbirth injury, and there is nothing to do but wait. I can do that. I know how to wait. I know how to push. I know my body. I know my babies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ray is going to share some of her um, story, uh, Caesarean Birth, Love, Sacrifice, and Surrender. She was also an honorable mention. Uh, Ray is an award-winning Canadian poet of Lebanese and Polish descent. 
passionate about writing as a tool for transformation. She teaches creative writing class to youth and adults in beautiful Nelson, British Columbia. She is the winner of the Richard Carver Award for Emerging Writers, the Golden Grassroots Chapbook Award, and the Geneva Literary, Literary Award in 2015. Her debut full-length poetry manuscript, Min Hayati, has just been released by Inanna Publications and Education Inc. in Toronto. Raya. Hey, thank you for having me. Uh, I feel so emotional just from listening to the beautiful readings before me, um, but I will pull myself here uh, to, share, to share my story. Um, and maybe before I do so, just to say that I actually wrote this essay 10 years ago, exactly a decade ago, and I wrote it frantically with two young kids and I was determined to send it to Mothering Magazine and I had the letter to Peggy all sent and ready to go and then that magazine actually stopped publishing, um, which happens, but I kind of took it as a sign that I was never going to publish or send my story anywhere um, and I just put it away. Um, so it's really interesting to, to find a different opportunity many, many years later um, and I think maybe it's just indicative that some stories just take a long time before they're actually ready to be shared or ready to be heard. Uh, so this is my essay. I'll, I'll start reading it and then in the middle, I'll take a little break to skip because it's a little bit long, but I'll fill you in on what happens. Caesarean birth, love, sacrifice and surrender. I remember the chill of the operating room, the glare of the lights, and the shadow of green robes moving in and out of my field of vision. My midwife reached for my hand as the anesthetist waited for the lull between contractions to insert the spinal tab. My husband was by my side, relaying every surgical step to me as he witnessed it over the canopy that separated us from my looming belly. I focus on his voice, let the words wash over me. At last they showed us our baby, wet, wriggly, screaming with new life. I marveled at the way he glowed, his anatomical perfection. The new love I felt flowed through a difficult recovery. First, there was immediate separation while I regained mobility. I remember waiting in the recovery room cold, wondering where was my baby and listening to nurses gossip in the other room. When we were re reunited, I fumbled to find positions to breastfeed without putting any weight on my tender abdomen. In shock, I discovered I was unable to burp, change, or even carry my baby. It took two days before I could walk or use the bathroom unassisted, five days until I felt able to go home. I was not prepared for this. I had wished for an empowering and natural birth. In my birth plan, I had requested the freedom to move, the use of the birthing tub, no drugs. Instead, I was immobilized on my back from the moment I was admitted to the hospital. First came the fetal monitor belt on, my, belt on my belly, then an internal monitor on my baby's scalp, eventually a catheter and an IV. I was my own nightmare image of a pin down butterfly tangled in tubes surrounded by beeping medical equipment. The reason for a cesarean on the charts reads, fetal distress and failure to progress. After six hours of active labor, I had only dilated two centimeters and the fetal heart monitor had showed a dropping heart rate an arresting heartbeat throughout contractions. This had made everyone worry, even the midwives. When my son was born, he had the cord around his neck and had been difficult to extract even by the hands of the surgeon. My pelvis shone with blue bruising for days where my son's head had been lodged. But could I have been fine without intervention? Could I have avoided a cesarean? Had I insisted, could I have had the natural birth I dreamt of? When I became pregnant three years later, I hoped for a different experience. Something inside of me had hardened. I wanted control over the destiny of my labor. By the end of my pregnancy, I had read enough on VBAC to make me an expert. I wanted to heal the past and I was convinced that if anything, the VBAC would do it. My last weeks of nesting were dedicated to preparing for the ultimate birth, the birth that would be everything the first one wasn't. I visualized birthing that baby vaginally. I created a collage of empowering pictures. I put together a bag of essential oils, concoctions, books, tools. I was ready to experience the most painful and powerful experience of my life. So I'll just pause here. Maybe you can guess by how I'm reading it, but that definitely did not happen. Um, my water broke and I didn't have any contractions 
And I, I waited and waited and prayed as long as I possibly could. And then after two days, I had a scheduled cesarean. Um, but the really interesting, the big learning was what came from having a second cesarean. Um, it was very different. So I'll just read the end. This time, my recovery was unbelievably smooth. The next day, I was able to walk slowly to the shower. And after 48 hours, I dressed my little love in a new white outfit and we went home. This time, there was no speculation or regret for needing medical intervention. When the midwife examined the placenta, she discovered that the umbilical cord was not secured, but that thin, veiny membranes had precariously attached themselves to the amniotic sac. For the first time in her 20 years, she was unable to extract enough cord blood for a routine blood test. Had my labor been long or stressful and the fragile cords attached, my baby would have had a mere three minutes to come out alive. Even a cesarean could not have saved him. My birth collage hangs above me and the words, my body is wise and know what's to do, stare back at me. I had read those words as a mantra to help me believe in my power as a woman to labor vaginally. But this baby, this body of mine had all the wisdom of the universe to not go into labor, but to wait patiently until skilled hands could assist. I was sure it would take a V back to heal the past, but ironically, it was a second cesarean that taught me the lesson I needed to learn. My scar tells a story of love, sacrifice, and surrender twice over. Thank you so much, Raya, for sharing your story. I think it's a really important one because we don't hear enough about the cesarean. I'm glad that you you send the story to us and we can share it. Um, now I would like to introduce uh, Ellie Re Reynolds. That's our next uh, writer. Uh, she's originally from the UK. She moved to Canada in 2007. She holds a BA in English from Cambridge University. And since moving to Canada, she has worked in early years community development as a children librarian. And more recently as a solo performer and theater maker. She lives with her husband, Charles, in Grey Creek in BC, and together they have three children. And um, as we know, as everybody in maternity care knows, there's no two, no two birds are the same, and uh, your story uh, is uh, portraying this quite uh, nicely, sorting by the title, From the Orgasmic to the Surgical, Two Bird Stories. Um, when we discuss your story, I think uh, one of the things that really came up is uh, the honesty that we felt when we read the story. Um, also, uh, there's always a suspense that keeps us reading your story in the story. And you have uh, you use lots of images in your writing that make the reader really understand how you feel. So, well, those are a few things that I like in the story. But many others. Um, so, uh, of course, no one wish for a cesarean birth, but I think everyone would wish the solidarity that you felt from people visiting you at the hospital. I thought that was very moving. Anyway, I'm going to let you talk about your story and tell your story. So I leave it to you. Uh, Thanks. Ellie. Thank you so much. Um, Hey, hey, Raya, we're neighbors. I'm just across the lake from you. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and, what, and I think the first, uh, the first reader said that, uh, actually a few of you have said that the, that the timing of this contest was so, um, was so serendipitous and interesting. And it was for me as well, because I have just written, uh, what the, this, I've just written a play about birth, about specifically my three, the three births of my kids. I'm a theatre maker. So, um, I've been working on writing this play for about two years, so I've been doing a lot of um, of trying to write about birth and just finding it so hard um, to, to write about it in a way that's that's compelling and dramatic and interesting and truthful. And then uh, and then I saw this contest the day that it um, was closing, so I very like quite rushed, really tried to grab a bunch of material from the play and turn it from a play into an essay. Um, uh, 
And I just performed the play for the first time last weekend uh, to 22 people in a small space, in a small yoga studio. And, uh, and it worked. Um, I, have, I have kids in the back. Anyway, um, so this uh, so this story this the, the essay just focuses on two two of the birth the second and the third because the uh, the contrast between them was so great, um, and I and I guess I shouldn't read all of it because it's long so I'll read the first part and then I'll 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 skip you to the second part. Um, let me just bring it up. Okay. When the day came to birth my second baby, I was delighted. The lights were dim in the theater of my bedroom and I, the birthing mother, sent a stage, the lead role. Or was it the baby really? I felt so ripe, the sugar was dripping off of me. I had eaten green pills full of cultured algae and that morning I had plucked ripe plums from the tree in my yard and swam naked in the lake through my early contractions and now it was dark, finally, and I was naked again, in the flow, in the dance, life in my pores and I was truly not afraid. I was a lotus flower opening, ready to hold hands and dance with the divine. And do you know what else? I was horny. I thought about what I had read somewhere, that the vagina widens during sexual arousal and the same uninhibited behavior as I enjoyed with my partner in the bedroom during sex could be brought into the bedroom when it came time for birth. This is so funny, my kids are fighting in the background. My toddler son was asleep downstairs and I called up to my husband to come and make love to me. He was very reluctant. You're in labor, it can't be right, he stammered, but I convinced him. The eventual waves of orgasm gave way to surges of blood and oxytocin flooding my brain and vagina and my uterus seemed to explode with echoing muscular spasms that went on and on and on. It was the most intense set of sensations my body has ever experienced. Pain, pleasure, contraction, expansion, birth, death, life. I felt so relaxed afterwards that I slipped into a meditative state and amazingly managed to fall asleep until fresh sensations awoke me and I got into the bath to cope. I didn't want to call our midwife until I was really in heavy labor. And by the time she arrived, I was fully dilated. She and my husband helped me out of the bath. I chose the toilet next. It felt good to push there, leaning on my husband who really didn't want me laboring on the toilet. I went onto all fours on the floor and with the next contraction, I could feel the head. The pressure was enormous. But when I reached down, I felt a hard balloon not hair, like an alien was trying to exit my body. The midwife was flustered. She delivered hundreds of babies, but this was her only, only her second time seeing a baby still in the call upon exiting. She pierced it and my daughter literally shot out of me. A silver watery cannon hitting the carpet before anyone could catch her and bringing with her a deluge. Her call stretched over her face and tiny body. Once the midwife had torn it away and she could breathe, I scooped up. I scooped up her wet little body and held it to my chest. She had arrived without fear. And now I will just skip ahead to the fact that um, I had, that was my second birth. So I now had two kids and we were absolutely done with kids. So I had an IUD fitted um, and thought no more of it until um, I realized that somehow I was pregnant for a third time, very much not. <laughs> Not what I was wanting at that point in my life, but um, I did decide to continue with the pregnancy and had a difficult pregnancy, difficult third pregnancy. Um, and uh, when I was week, a week away from my due date with my third, we were in a bit of a crunch. My husband and I, we were trying to renovate our living room before the baby was born. And um, so here we are. At 39 weeks, I was up late helping my husband to lay a new floor in the living room. We were desperate to get it done before our brand new couches arrived and before my mum arrived from England and before the baby came. I was tired. I knew I shouldn't be bending over like that. I shouldn't be lifting. I shouldn't even be awake, but I wasn't listening to my gut. Suddenly I felt a gush and my pajamas were soaked. My first thought that my water had broken, but then I realized I was bleeding a lot. My husband spiraled into panic, but I remained eerily calm. 
I was tired. I just wanted to go to bed and deal with the bleeding in the morning. I did call the midwife though, when alarmed, she came right over. She saw the trails of blood all over the floor and as calmly as she could, told my husband to call an ambulance. He replied it would take 40 minutes to arrive and that we were better off driving. I couldn't face the idea of waking our two small children and dragging them into, into the car to the hospital to face goodness knows what. So I pleaded with him to stay and let our midwife drive me to the hospital in her car. He agreed, though I could tell he didn't want to. It was midnight and there was no, no moon to be seen. It was an hour's drive to the hospital and I was still in my pajamas, still bleeding. She was driving fast. I was trying to keep calm, but by then I was in hysterical tears, the most frightened I've ever been. It was so dark and the road full of twists and turns. I had a sudden, I had a sudden vision of a deer running out into the road and a split second later, one did. Bam. The poor creature hit the front bumper, taking out one of the headlights completely. And with the one remaining, we drove on feeling awful about the deer, but in too much of a hurry to stop. The doctors had been notified and they were waiting for me. I was so attached to the idea of myself as a capable birthing woman that I even asked if I could just maybe rest and maybe labor would start naturally. I hadn't had a single contraction yet, but both doctor and midwife said a cesarean was safer. So I agreed. Everything that followed terrified me. The IV, the spinal, the shaving, the wheelchair, the bright cold lights of the theater, the fact that no one seemed to be talking directly to me, just to each other. I wished so hard that my husband was there to hold my hand and tell me what was going on. I was used to birth being an undisturbed intimate act with me at the center of it. And here I was a vessel out of which they needed to quickly extract a baby who might at any moment run out of oxygen. I heard him cry. And then the cry was quickly a faraway sound. What had happened? Where was he? Was he okay? It was an awful feeling. And it lasted maybe 15 minutes until I saw dressed in scrubs and holding a bundle, none other than my husband. Our wonderful midwife had called a neighbor to keep watch over the house and sleeping children, allowing him to get into the car and race to the hospital just in time to be handed our son who was alive, though he had needed resuscitation. My husband handed the baby to me and every feeling of doubt, regret and reluctance instantly disappeared. I was so full of relief and love that I was completely overcome. The surgeon told me that my placenta was about one third detached from the uterus wall when he got my baby out. An exceptionally dangerous scenario. I guess I would have just carried on bleeding until I had much to be thankful for that night and I was. I was also still in profound shock. I couldn't stop shaking and the return of sensation in my lower body after the spinefall was terribly painful. My husband had to leave me after about an hour and drive back home to our kids. It was a long night and I had no idea cesarean recovery was so painful. Over the next few days, well-meaning but inexperienced nurses kept trying to get me to stand up, which I simply could not manage. I couldn't manage ever walking again, but some wonderful things happened that week. I had made a brief post on Facebook saying what had happened and that I was in the hospital in case anyone wanted to visit, and they did. Women I hardly knew came to visit, and I realized it was in part because they had also had cesarean births and they knew how painful the recovery was. They understood that I felt disappointed, somehow broken and very fragile. They brought me fruit, held my baby and told me their birth stories. The ones I realized I hadn't heard before because I had only sought out empowering stories and cesarean birth stories were the ones I had avoided. I felt humbled and profoundly changed as I spent the next week in the hospital, figuring out how to get around while healing from major abdominal surgery. I spent most of my time snuggling this heavenly baby who didn't appear to be scarred by his sudden and violent surgical birth. For the first time since becoming a mother to my first child, I was allowed to actually rest. There was no housework, no cooking, laundry, bedtimes. My only job was to heal and take care of this most beautiful and mysterious baby who surprised me just as much with the way he entered my body as with the way he exited. And that's the end. Thank you so much. Sorry, I'm just going to say that was lovely. That the imagery, both the first part of the imagery was just so inspiring. I started crying. Second part of the imagery was just so moving. Still crying. Thank you so much, Anna. We'll move on to Ashley to introduce the next story.
I have the honor of introducing um, Stella Marizzi. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Stella. Um, Stella is a curious observer of life as a personal coach and educator to those seeking an alternative and more expansive way of living. She embraces the darkness and encourages her clients to dare to discover with divine curiosity. Uh, there's no conversation too big or too small to be had. She enjoys writing, research, painting, DIYing, teaching Kundalini yoga and eating well. And she shares her life with her loving husband and dear son, Declan. She lives her life in the process of perpetual, di perpetual discovery of her own truth. And she knows that in life, there is always more than meets the eye. And you can follow her on Instagram at Stella underscore Shakti or follow her blog and work at Stella with one L Shakti.com. Um, great intro. And um, I'll just share some of my takeaways, Stella. Um, there's so much to love about your story. Uh, I love when a birth story blurs the lines of when birth begins and ends because birth vibrates far earlier and echoes far later than culture would have us believe. I love that this is a NICU story because when parents are born, so are warriors and NICU parents are a special brand of warrior. Um, I love the invitation to witness the trials of those days, the unexplored depth of emotion the wisdom downloaded and as a reflection of the divine energy found in extraordinary moments and challenges that life brings. And I really love that the voice in the story demands a challenge to the markers that we assign in the sense of a good or bad or incorrect or correct kind of dyad when we talk about birthing. Um, culturally, we seem really quick to understand the idea of trauma from a story that deviates from the ideal, but not the potential for truth, for wisdom, and even for healing. And I love that this story flips the script in such a way um, that it's steeped in the language of perfection. Um, Stella, thanks so much for putting your story out to the world and for sharing it with us today. I, um, I'm deeply emotional, um, with all the stories that have been shared so far and that introduction, I mean, I was like, holy fuck, how am I going to follow that? And it's like, <laughs> and the truth of it is, it's like, there's such beauty and all the uniqueness of all the stories and then the weaving together of, of where they meet and kind of like how, oh, it's just so beautiful. So I'm really, really grateful for the women here for um, the opportunity to write this this the story. I mean, Jose, fucking brilliant. Um, I'm I'm so like I mean that calling my son a warrior. It's like, he's like it's in his name. It's his his name is Declan. It means um, a man of prayer. Uh, of goodness and I mean the mimicking of the story between my story and, and, and how I see myself and my my mother and who's here listening to this and oh, so I'm almost speechless and yet I have lots to say um I loved at the beginning the uh, what Karen was talking about about it this notion of an empowered birth and how has that has been taken um, I believe systematically from us historically. And it is time right now to shift toward that a matriarchal kind of birthing experience. And I'm hearing that through throughout all the stories today and and moreover. So it's like this is the domain of women. Birthing is the domain of women. And our bodies know and So I feel like this was an opportunity to take back power for me, um, not only through writing the story, but also being here and hearing all these stories and sharing. Um, so I encourage anyone who's ever birthed, like to absolutely keep sharing, to, to write their story and then share it out loud because it makes a difference. And so as I'm saying that, the most empowering thing for me to do right now would be to read my story. I hadn't planned on doing that, but I would like to do that. And so, um, Thank you for, for listening in advance. So I'll just pull it up here. 
So the title of my story is When My Story Became His Story, so history. I was one of those women who felt exceptionally well prepared for my perfect birth. I consciously chose to become a mother. I knew what I wanted out of my pregnancy, and I knew the kind of birth I'd have, a gentle, natural birth delivered in the tub, preferably orgasmic, because why not? I would deliver my baby at the birthing center with a midwife's present, my priceless doula, my mother, and the man I lovingly chose to share my life with. No doctors, no nurses, no medical intervention. And that's exactly how the birth of my firstborn born son started. Quite frankly, I simply could not have imagined what actually unfolded. I walked into the midwife center that Saturday afternoon at 41 weeks and six days pregnant to get my third membrane sweep. At this point, the 42 week mark was fast approaching. I had been worrying about that arbitrary number because I did not want to be induced. My contractions had started on Friday at midnight and that afternoon my midnight said, this baby's coming today. Knowing we were hours away with nothing to do but wait, we went for lunch at a local restaurant and that's where the contractions intensified. It was quite comical being in the presence of people enjoying their lunch all determined to pretend they didn't notice a lady literally about to pop. Following that lunch, we went to a birthing center and my perfect birth began to unfold. I had the people I adored beside me, I was warm in the tub and I thoroughly enjoyed each of the contractions. I was so relaxed and deeply in tune with the rhythms of my body. I was having a wonderful labor. I was drifting in and out of this world. Time disappeared, space collapsed. I was in such a beautiful trance state that every contraction was bringing me closer to meeting my son. I felt everything and I enjoyed every minute of it. And then an unexpected turn. Seemingly out of the blue, everything changed. My contractions became painfully intense. So there was no longer any break between waves. They moved upward rather than downward. The baby had turned and he was stuck against my pubic bone. My cervix was swollen and I regressed in dilation. The pain was so intense that I could not let anyone touch me. I had a visceral sensation like I was going to die. I knew something wasn't right. I made that decision at that moment to go to the hospital. I needed an epidural. I dropped all notions of what should be and all the plans that I had and I opted for, for what felt right in my body. Thank goodness I listened. When I arrived at the hospital, the staff noticed that my baby's heart rate was erratic, something sometimes too high and other times too low and dropping. The doctor warned me that his heart rate might, meet, might be too low for me to give, to give me the epidural, but my little guy's heart rate went up just enough for them to deliver the much needed epidural. Immediately after, his heart rate dropped critically low, 58 beats per minute. When I saw that number, my own heart skipped a beat. It confirmed what I already knew. This was a normal. At that moment, the doctor walked in and said that we had to rush into emergency surgery. This baby needed to come out now. So I gave up any and all notions of control over how I wanted this birth to unfold. I let go. I trusted the process. I accepted what was. Everything happened so fast. Two minutes later, and I'm not kidding, <laughs> I heard the voice of an angel crying. The time was 11.58 p.m. I looked over and I saw my little guy and I waited to meet him. Eventually, after what felt like an eternity, but was probably like two minutes, <laughs> the staff wrapped him up and placed him beside me. Hello, my dear Declan. He was truly the most beautiful being I had ever seen. Immediately, he made and sustained eye contact with me, those deep, dark eyes staring into mine. I thought to myself, this child is alert, aware, and awake. That moment is forever frozen in the eternity for me. Then the totally unexpected happened. Unfortunately, that moment didn't last long. De Declan had meconium in his lungs and was keeping him from getting a full breath. The doctors were concerned that his heart rate wasn't stabilizing, so he was whisked away for more interventions. My son spent his first day in intensive care out of the warmth and comfort of my womb. At least his devoted father was by his side every single moment. Meanwhile, I was left in my own room recovering and had to wait until the next morning to see him. That was the longest night of my life. And just kind of as a side note, which I didn't know and we discussed yesterday is that the pediatrician had told my husband, 
if you don't have any pictures of this little guy, this would be a good time to take them. And meanwhile, I was left to recover. Being in the neonatal intensive care unit the, of the hospital was the safest place for our son to be, and yet we still didn't know if he was safe. The next time I saw my newborn son was heartbreaking. His delicate skin was poked countless times with needles for blood tests and an IV. He had tubes down his throat to remove the meconium. He was pumped full of antibiotics to fight off the infections. He had a CPAP machine covering half his tiny face. His heart rate was lower than any of the other babies in the NICU. I couldn't see his face. I couldn't pick him up. I couldn't hold him. I couldn't comfort him. In our inability to know any particular outcome, but choose to trust anyway, my husband and I allowed our tears to flow. The next day, the hospital staff decided to send Declan to a specialized unit at a pediatric hospital. Fortunately for us, one of the top children's hospital in the country was less than half an hour away, but this meant that my baby had been taken further away from me while I was stuck in my room. Before we were further separated, I held him for the first time. Such a magical, bittersweet moment. How did this happen? 12 hours ago, my body was Declan's home, and now we were miles apart, sleeping in separate beds in separate cities. None of this was part of my plan. Although I had asked my family and friends not to visit because I wanted to be alone, they showed up anyway. I felt supported in ways I didn't expect. My heart filled with joy to be surrounded with so much love, to know that no matter what, I am never alone. Sleeping on my own in the hospital bed that night was incredibly lonely. I felt immense guilt that I couldn't be with my son. I felt I was failing him at every turn. I was pumping colostrum through a mechanical device so that at least I could support him in that way and ensure my milk would come in. I cried like never before. The next day, I finally decided to release myself from the hospital and I spent all day with him. I wanted to stay with him all night, but I had nowhere to sleep, and so I agreed to spend the night with my parents. The massive heartbreak I felt in my chest turned, to, it per, turned into a pervasive panic attack. I couldn't fathom the idea of being separated from him one more whole night. Everything hurt. I felt like I was failing him. So much for my plan of not leaving his aura for the first 40 days. So much for minimal medical interventions. So much for that magical latching moment. But my husband saw things differently. In his own wise way, he reassured me that I was doing my best. He reminded me to let go of notions that were not serving me, our son, or our family. After all, my protective aura is massive and all-encompassing, transcending both time and space. I was fully present to my son, myself, and our co-created experience. To take good care of him, I had to prioritize myself. I trusted that he was in good hands, both with the staff and his loving father. During those three days at the NICU, little by little, more and more wires came off my son. I could hold him and comfort him. And though he wouldn't latch, he was drinking from a bottle just fine. On the afternoon that third day, finally, we took our son home with a clean bill of health. When we got home, overwhelming relief took over me. We could finally enjoy our son, our new life as a family. I couldn't stop crying tears of absolute joy. We were safe, we were home, we were the lucky ones. The following few months were as beautiful as they were challenging. They were perfect in their immeasurable imperfection. So there's always lessons learned. It took me many months to grieve the loss of the birth experience I thought I'd have. And the process I discovered that there is tremendous intelligence in the birth experience I did have. The birth of my son taught me so much about planning that which is magical and unknown. It simply is impossible. Most of us have notions of what we want, but we forget that the birth process is one of powerful co-creation. No matter the books, the classes, the yoga, the meditations, the advice, birth is unknowable and it is divine. Our birth story also taught me the power of epigenetics in recreating that which is in heal. You see, my own birth story isn't too different from the one I co-created with my son. Emergency cesarean, baby born unwell, mother and child separating. In the retelling of the story, my story, survival was emphasized, but not much more. So I know that my son and I co-created this intense, erratic, chaotic, majestic, joyous, massive, beautiful birth so that we can heal the trauma of my own birth story and evolve. My son and I co-created this 
birth so that I could stand in that pivotal moment of choosing history or gracefully moving forward. We co-created his birth so that I might witness my son growing up free of birth trauma because I consciously healed my own and lovingly accepted the totality of what is. For that, I am eternally grateful. In that, I feel free. Finally, through the process of his birth, I discovered my own strength, resilience, and determination that reflected back to me from my son. I discovered also how wise this little being is in his ability to keep calm, even in the toughest situations. I discovered that although he is tiny, he is immensely brave, curious, and mighty. He is a partner in the co-creation of our lives together. I can't wait to experience him unfolding more into exactly who he is. It's been a year and a half since Declan was born, and looking back now, I know that I would have it no other way. I believe there is intelligence to how everything unfolds, and I choose to look for that in my life. Birth, like life itself, is highly unpredictable, and that's what makes it so spectacularly magical. The story of the birth of my son is one of resilience and resourcefulness. It is unique in its unfolding. It is majestic. It is powerful and immense. It is magical. It is a story filled with intensity and joy, love and heartbreak, learning and discovering. It isn't the story that I had imagined, but it's the perfect birth story because it is our story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stella. You're uh, such a strong woman. Uh, is that we need some silence after that? Um, such powerful story. Uh, sorry. Okay. So okay. We are having a child meltdown, so we may have to rearrange some of the stories a little bit. Um, so we are going to go to Winter Rose, the story of Winter Rose, which I believe won second, <coughs> correct? Second prize? Mm -hmm. Jose? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so we're just going to skip to that one, and then we will go back and resume that one. So the introduction for this one uh, will be Lamara. Yes, hello everybody. Um, I'm sorry, Tanya, to have to bump you up like this, but my daughter's having a meltdown and I have to go down and save her. <laughs> so um, yeah, thank you so much for uh, letting me be part of the jury uh, this year. It was really an interesting experience. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about Tanya and then uh, explain what our, uh, I guess, impressions and, and feelings were towards uh, her text. So Tanya uh, Bellumeur Alat, sorry, I'm saying this with my French accent, <laughs> is a mother of four. So her fiction essays and poems have appeared in Best Canadian Essays 2019 and Best Canadian Essays 2015, The New Quarterly Grain Event, Prairie Fire, Malahat Review, Subterrain, Car Carte Blanche, Antigonish Review, Queen's Quarterly and Room, among other publications. She holds an MA from McGill University and an MFA in creative writing from UBC. Tanya is the author of the poetry collection, Chaos Theories of uh, Goodness. And she has released um, newly a book called Peacekeeper's Daughter, a Middle East memoir published by Thistledown Press. And it's now available in bookstores across Canada and online, Amazon and Chapters. It has recently been nominated for the Quebec Writers Federation Mavis Gallant Award for Nonfiction. So uh, the jury, uh, when we were discussing uh, Tanya's story, uh, we especially appreciated Winter Rose, not only for its interesting content, which you will be hearing, uh, but also the way that the writing was extremely refined, light, and the passages contained a lot of imagery. Uh, metaphors, and there was a certain flow to the sentences. So here it is, Winter Rose by Tanya. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. This has been um, really moving to hear these stories. So my, my youngest child, I have four, and my youngest child is uh, turning 18 next month. So birth is like a long ways behind me, but hearing everyone's story has made it so vivid again. <laughs> feel really privileged to be part of this sharing circle today. So my piece Winter Rose begins with a, a quote from Henry Miller. 
we live at the edge of the miraculous. Winter rose. The sun hadn't yet come up when Brian and I arrived at the birthing center. Jean, my midwife, suggested we all sit down to a hearty breakfast to build up our strength for the day ahead. Her apprentice midwife, Annalise, prepared scrambled eggs and hot buttered toast for the four of us, served with steaming mugs of tea. We sat at a round table in the kitchen, enjoying each other's company. Jean had been my midwife for each of my four pregnancies and had been present at all the births. We had a long and colorful history together. I felt grateful to have her at my side, knowing how one look from her could give me strength when I needed it most. I wondered how this birth, perhaps my last, would be different from the others. I birthed Jacob on my hands and knees in the middle of a November night. Weighing only five pounds, he'd been the smallest baby on the ward, but strong enough not to need incubation. Two and a half years later, at the end of May, Emma had arrived at high noon a surprise to all of us at only 35 weeks gestation. Like her brother, she was tiny, but strong. When Emma was only 18 months old, Micah was born on the cusp of the winter solstice in the birthing center's fire-themed room. At 37 weeks, he was my biggest baby, not quite seven pounds. What might this fourth birth reveal about the child to come? What might it reveal about me? Until my first pregnancy, I'd felt that my body had often betrayed me. It wasn't especially strong or fit or reliable. I'd never been an athlete, never scored a single goal or won a race. As an academic and a writer, I had lived my life mostly in my mind and emotions. My body was a subordinate part of myself, sometimes made to go without sleep or food for periods of time while I was working to meet a deadline. This was something Jean and I had discussed. She was concerned that I'd grown so divorced from my body that I might not be able to have a vaginal birth. She challenged me to consider that I might need a cesarean, but I told her that I was determined to give birth naturally, as my mother had. All my life, I'd heard my mother tell the story of how I'd almost been born in the car, how she hadn't had time to change out of her dress. My father had left the car running while he'd escorted her into the British military hospital near our home in Germany. He'd left her in the care of the attending nurse and gone back to park the car. Once he returned, the nurse congratulated him on the birth of his baby girl. I told Jean I could do it. I would give birth the way my mother had. She encouraged me to visualize the way I wanted it to go. Not too quickly, which could lead to chaos, but not too slowly either. I added prayer to the visualization, a process which brought me comfort and built up my faith. During that first birthing process, I was amazed by what my body was able to achieve without a single drug. Rather than folding in on itself in resistance to pain as I'd feared it might, it opened with each contraction to make space for the baby. The endorphins it released made me feel as if I were high. I'd heard about this runner's high from friends who were endurance athletes, but experience it, experiencing it for myself was an unexpected gift. My second and third births were physically more challenging than the first, but just as empowering. With each one, I grew more sure of myself, more connected and reconciled to my body. My births were wonderful, but my pregnancies were hard. With this fourth one, I'd been on bed rest for several months because of nausea, extreme fatigue, early contractions, and an effaced cervix. Yet in spite of all the challenges, I'd carried this baby the longest for 39 weeks. With the other births, I'd called Jean from home, my labor well underway, but this time I'd called her because my water had broken. Since an ultrasound at 20 weeks had shown an unusually low placenta, Jean asked me to meet her at the birthing center right away, even though I wasn't yet in labor. Nighttime was the easiest time to leave the house. Jacob, Emma, and Micah, aged six, three and a half, and two, were sleeping peacefully. 
Brian's mother came over to watch them and we slipped out the door. The first part of the process was just as I'd prayed it would be. But after we'd finished our breakfast, breakfast with Jean and had a second cup of tea, I still hadn't had any contractions. The baby was high in the uterus. My other births had been quick, but Jean said she expected this labor and delivery to be longer than the previous ones. She told me that often women who've birthed many children will hold on to their last child in the womb and delay the delivery, not wanting the pregnancy and this unique aspect of motherhood to end. It made sense to me. I loved coming to the birthing center for my hour long appointments. I had come to rely on Jean's wisdom, knowledge and experience. Her presence brought me strength. Over the last six years through pregnancy and breastfeeding, I'd inhabited my body and my sexuality in a new way. I'd become part of a community of women. All of these experiences were both physical and deeply spiritual. I didn't want them to end, but four pregnancies in six years had taken a strong toll. At 33 years old, my body was tired. Jean was encouraging me to take a break. I needed to give myself ample time to recover before becoming pregnant again. I acknowledged the truth of her words, but wasn't sure I could give this up. I'd settled into this identity. I wasn't ready to move on to a new one. Knowing that I liked to labor in the water, Jean suggested that I settle into the birthing center's gigantic tub. Once I'd transitioned into active labor, I'd move to the bed in the birthing room. Brian lit a few candles. We chatted softly. Jean was the oldest and most experienced midwife in our region and a champion of midwifery in Quebec. She had assisted at over 600 births and had many stories to tell, especially about the early days of her career when she'd done house calls all over the rural Eastern townships. She told us about women she'd worked with in Northern Canadian communities who at 10 centimeters dilation with their cervix fully effaced would sit down to eat a feast. Once they'd built up their strength and celebrated this last moment of pregnancy with the women of their village, they'd bring their baby into the world. It's the mother who decides when to let go and release her baby, Jean said. This was so different than other birth stories I'd heard from women around me about unwelcome inductions and interventions Decisions made by medical personnel, often without consulting the birthing woman. Jean's words enveloped me like the warm water I was soaking in. Soon, the contractions began. They came steadily at five-minute intervals. I closed my eyes with each one, inhabiting my body in greater measure and thanking God for this baby about to come. Each contraction came like a wave, reaching a peak and then subsiding. A few minutes before 9 a.m., Brian slipped a worship CD into the stereo. Cello and piano vibrations filled the room, accompanied by the chorus of my favorite song, Your Mercy Awakens My Soul. I felt a push against my ribs, as if my baby were diving down in response to the song. Then came a burning at my cervix and a strong, undeniable urge to push. Jean reached into the water. Bibi est là, I heard her say to Annalise. Baby is here. We were all taken by surprise. I'd skip the relentless transition phase when the interval between the contractions thins until the next one begins where the last one ended, like a snake eating its tail. Should we move her out of the bathtub? Brian sounded worried. We hadn't planned on a water birth. We couldn't move her if we tried, Jean answered. Her voice held its usual confidence and calm. A Belgian midwife who specialized in water births had just arrived at the birthing center for her 9 a.m. clinic. Annalise ran to get her. The word mercy filled my mind. It was as if the baby were responding to the song that swirled around the room. Your mercy awakens my soul. Jean had said that it's the mother who decides when to let go and release her baby. But I felt it was my baby who decided in that moment and in that way to be born. I just needed to cooperate, open, yield. 
Jean lifted my baby out of the water and placed her on my chest. It's a girl, she said softly. An ecstatic feeling unlike anything I've ever experienced before enveloped my body, mind and spirit. I felt transported by joy, lifted out of myself. Our baby, Priscilla Eve, was my winter rose, desire fulfilled. I held her small miraculous body against mine and let this new beginning sing its song of mercy over me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tanya. There's so much gentleness in your writing and in your voice. It's always surprising when we, after reading the stories, when we meet the people who read the story, it brings even, it's even more moving. Anyway, thank you very much for sharing. Um, now I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Leslie Harris. She wrote a story called In the Dark. And um, okay, Leslie, uh, she's a mother of two grown adults of 25 and 26 years old and soon to be a grandmother. Our youngest is pregnant and she's got the similar issue uh, with her pregnancy as her. Um, Leslie works with children with special needs, which she loves. She also loves writing stories and poetry, reading, uh, knitting, sewing, painting, uh, and doing other crafts. Um, she likes to travel with her husband, with their small dogs, in their travel trailer, canoeing and hiking. Her mother also lives with them. So, um, so into the dark, I was a... Uh, it's two very difficult pregnancy that uh, Leslie had. And when I was reading those stories, I was wondering what would have happened today. <laughs> That's a question that came to my mind because I I'm not sure you would have, have had vaginal delivery if it was happening today. So that maybe that's a, a, a question that Karen could answer. You you could have you may have some talk about it. Anyway, I just want to let you share your story, Leslie. Well, thank you. <clears throat> right before my battery started to die, so I was scrambling to get my charger. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone um, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, congratulations to the other writers, the readers and the judges um, and the organizers of this event. I also fell onto this by accident. Uh, when looking for a doula for my daughter who's pregnant. Um, and I had never heard of a doula. Um, I had heard of midwives, but I'd never heard of a doula. So I was quite intrigued. And when we began to research, I, I came across this and I too also found it on the day of the contest um, ending. And so I was frantically writing uh, within the hour before the closing of the midnight. And as Jose can attest, um, I had issues with uploading and which of course was partly my fault when you wait until five minutes before midnight to submit, you know, you're gonna find out that you have problems with your document from your iPad. But anyway, I don't wanna digress, but it was, it was, a, it was a healing journey for me and um, and I agree, and I agree listening to the newest stories of people, um, I would not have probably, um, probably fully had either of the girls naturally. Um, and the doctor that I had um, with my first child, which I'll tell you about in my story, he was of the belief, I've been doing this for 25 years, and she can do it naturally. And if it takes two days, that's okay. Um, and despite the fact that she was in distress, the trauma that it caused her brain, um, the swelling and the, the things that happened to her, you know, she was left to be trapped there and us to sort of witness the diving of also of her, um, her heart rate and things. So I'll tell my story and then I'll ad lib. I find humor in my therapy. And so um, I'm typically not one to be emotional. And a side note, my daughter is a NICU nurse. Um, so there comes healing in that. And although she keeps all her stories private when she comes home, she attended 
Uh, she's like delivering at Christmas. She's 25 and she's attended more than 100 births herself. So she will come home with snippets of what she can tell us, but they're interesting. And it, to me, it's interesting the progress of the birth and how they immediately will do a C-section and they won't let the mother get in distress as I have. So to answer you, Jose, I know that I would have been better cared for. I refrain from telling her too much of my story because I just don't want her to be fearful although she sees the end result of babies that are born early, although she made a statement, she's also having complications with her pregnancy. And she made a statement the other day, I made it to 31 weeks. We live in Barrie, which is close to Toronto. So she said, I'm at 31. So if I have a 30 week winner, um, I, I will be going to our local hospital where she works and not have to go to sick kids. So she felt relief in that knowing that she would be at her home hospital and not having to, to travel further. So I'm like, no 31 weekers, please. Please, so let's keep you going. So anyway, she's been close to bed rest herself. So I'll tell you my story. All right. So to tell my story is a story of two labors, both equally important, as also mentioned earlier. Um, I cannot tell one without the other, both difficult in conception, sustaining their lives and bringing them into the world. It has been a therapeutic journey, an outlet to heal some of the trauma that I have suffered during these two distinct experiences. And I'll also note that I changed my story for today because I wanted to add a few more things. Um, I felt I wasn't listened to or respected. And although a lot has changed since the birth of my daughters, modern advances in diagnostic medicines of pregnancies and push presence, uh, one thing that remains the same is babies still enter the world with the help of others. And although I did not know or have a doula, I'm sure I would have loved one. My doula was my husband. A little humor there. Um, but in all seriousness, to have had a doula would have guided me through a difficult journey or journeys that I considered myself to have survived. I am a lucky to be alive. But because I was in the dark when I was delivered, the title as my story states, I was in the dark both metaphorically and literally. My stories went like this. I wanted children desperately, and we, we finally resorted to fertility treatments, which were new at the time. When hearing about my friends' pregnancies, births, and their baby showers was like a jab to my heart. But then there came the day that I found out that I was pregnant. But you can't have a birth story until you have a pregnancy story. Um, sorry, both of my stories were high risk, complex, and long, or they seem long to me, especially when you're confined to a bed for two months. Hyperemesis, placenta previa, preeclampsia are nothing to scoff at. I felt like I had everything that was in the what to expect when you're expecting book. Never have I ever was going to felt like I was going to hold my baby. Finally, the day came of my first labor, which started with headaches, protein in my urine and high blood pressure, classic preeclampsia symptoms. I had a birth plan in place. I brought my little figurine, which I was to focus on. I had planned on walks. I had planned on massages. I had planned on back rubs and showers. I had an, an up, even an epidural on my list. I was three centimeters dilated and I was told that the baby would be coming tonight. Within minutes, the power went out, the backup generators came on and lighting was minimal. My husband decided that this was a perfect time to have a nap, cozy and warm, in his little recliner, I slept and groaned while he snored. An intern came in and told me that they had decided they were gonna send me home. To my horror, I said, how can I go home? I'm three centimeters dilated, I'm having contractions because they had me hooked up to the monitors. How can you send me home when I'm preparing to have birth? Well, I'm sorry, but we're preparing your discharge papers. I felt it was truly related to the power outage. I woke my husband and, and told him that we, we were being sent at home. And after his questioning, I realized that my water broke just when I stood up. The nurse came in and didn't believe me and said, really, your water broke right now. And I said, yes, it did. I'm telling you, I didn't pee on the floor. My water broke. So she went and got litmus paper. She checked, went to the bathroom where there was an emergency light and said, oh, look at that. Your water did break. Well, I'll go and tell them at the desk they decided that I was going to stay. But it was a slow birth, 37 hours, I was kept in the dark, no talking, no TV, no walking, and my birth and plan went silently out the window. It was scary, I won't lie. Um, I was hooked up to every monitor possible because I was up, my blood pressure was extremely high. I don't remember what it was, I just know it was extremely dangerous. My birthing plan went out the window, um, 
sorry, I mentioned that. I was hooked up to every mon monitor possible. Blood pressure, heart monitor, fetal monitor, catheter, IV, epidural, you name it, I had it. But finally, after two hours of pushing and being trapped in the birth canal, she arrived all pink and beautiful. I was torn and cut, which would later require surgery after the birth of my second baby. Emotionally drained and physically exhausted, but as you all know, that little baby was the ultimate push present. My second labor was compri com com sorry, comprised of placenta previa, two months of bed rest, and told the baby might not survive. I was given a pamphlet and told of what to prepare when a baby's delivered under two pounds. I had a clot forming uh, alongside where the placenta was tearing away. I never had any blood showing. But she arrived at 9.45 in the morning, bright and early and healthy. I did have a bit of a labor of 17, sorry, 17 hours and was so overjoyed at, the at her arrival that it all fell to the wayside, or th so I thought. It later became apparent to me that I was traumatized by these experiences, and I carry a lot of that to me with this day, especially where I have so much scar tissue and probably requ require another surgery. I did not have a doula, as I previously mentioned, and I believe it would have changed this process. I would have had a guide and support and someone to navigate me through what was happening. But I had not even heard of a doula until recently, as I mentioned about my own daughter requiring help. Um, so anyway, that's the end of my story. Um, and I, I already talked about her a bit at the beginning. But anyway, I just wanted to say that that you that you know, I'm, I'm a lot older than most of you here. And some of you've had babies recently, like up to 2017, you've mentioned. And although mine's a long time ago, you still carry that, that damage and that trauma of nobody believing in you and the fear. After our first baby, my husband held her up. She wasn't even two minutes old. And he said, you see this, this is all we're going to have. You can't do this again. You almost died. We had a second baby. My doctor, my obstetrician, who gave me the fertility drugs for both my girls, he held my hand and said, this is it. You can't have any more. We almost lost you again. So um, so we made the decision to have no more, you know, no more children. I don't know. Maybe today I would have maybe even had more given the risks if, if I had been properly managed. But anyway, they're here. It was a wonderful journey. I'm so so fortunate to be here today with all of you and um there's been humor and sadness and uh i appreciate it thank you thank you thank you leslie um i think that we need there uh, some time to uh to process the little bit between each stories it's a, it's a lot to take in <laughs> i'm so pleased to introduce everybody to allison milan uh, I was so charmed by Allison's birth story, Mama Fitz. Uh, they use the word journey early on in their piece to describe their experience of exploring queerness and gender. Um, and I think that's the perfect word to describe the story itself, a journey. Uh, Mama Fitz is funny, beautifully written and full of hope. Uh, so a little bit about Allison. Allison Milan, whose pronouns are she, they, lives on unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin Anishinaabeg territory with their partner, daughter and two cats. Uh, her interest in birth and desire to empower to be parents of all sorts sparked a desire to share the story of her daughter's birth. Allison loves to explore food and the great outdoors, study geography and education at York University, and works as a policy analyst with Natural Resources Canada. So welcome, Allison. Thank you so much, Leah. I'm, I'm so honored to be introduced by you. <laughs> uh, thanks to everyone who shared. I've really adored hearing all of these stories. I've been laughing, I've been crying. I've got a wad of tissues with me. Uh, a million thanks to the foundation and to Jose for all your hard work in making this happen. And thank you to Andre for suggesting that I write and submit the story of my daughter's birth from earlier this year. Uh, I have lamented to my partner that it seems that no one actually cares to hear a real birth story, not just the highlights, the scary emergency situations or the funny anecdotes or the stats, X pounds and X inches long, but a real front to back birth story. Mine is a three day adventure that is firmly imprinted on me, a real journey, as Leah said. Uh, I've half joked that if I had some other life changing experience, say taking a gap year to travel, people would be lining up to hear my TED talk about how I found myself while cycling through Barcelona. Birth can be the single most transformative event in a person's life. It certainly has been that for me, but when telling my birth story, with a few exceptions, people don't 
even want to hear the condensed two minute G rated version. I cannot stress enough how grateful I am to have had the opportunity to articulate my experience uh, in the story that I wrote for this contest and for the opportunity to speak to all of you behind your computer screens about it today. So my story is of me becoming a mama, not a mom, a mommy, a mother, or anything else. It's a story of pregnancy and birth challenging my own identity and coming to know myself. I'm lucky that in welcoming my daughter into the world, my identity as a parent was relatively clear to me. It, um, I, I know it's not something that is clear to everyone else. And it's, you know, for those who fall outside the cisgender bubble, not everyone's so lucky to have that. Um, but amidst the many pregnancy and postpartum challenges that I experienced, um, not identifying as a woman, the title mama rose above it all, clear as day. I decided not to read my story today, maybe trying to nudge you to read it for yourself if you haven't already. Uh, rather than read it, I'm going to tell the story through the series of, series of feelings that my daughter's birth brought me through the process of birthing. The first feeling is loneliness. Pregnancy is deeply embedded in femininity. I knew with each passing day of my pregnancy, the world around me saw me growing more womanly, and that was painful. The feeling coupled with the isolation of a winter COVID pregnancy made me feel like I was in hiding, concealing myself in my changing form, though I was so proud of my body and what it was doing. On more than one occasion, I remarked that my pregnancy felt like that of an unwed teenager in the 1950s, sent off to the nuns, only to reappear nine months later to my family and friends, magically not pregnant. A COVID safe pregnancy meant very little fanfare. There were friend, family, and coworker time to be worked in, but with less external excitement than I'd expected and counted on, to keep my spirits up, keep, keep me going towards the end, it was hard to sustain that myself. Pregnancy was incredible, but it was incredibly isolating. The second feeling is impatience. When I hit 37 weeks, almost immediately, I felt the way many people do late in pregnancy, ready for it to be over. Ultrasound showed that my baby was big, uh, not earth shatteringly big, but big enough. My mother-in-law often repeated her horror story at my partner's birth. Head was too big, got stuck, and boom, emergency cesarean. I tried to quell my fears that that script wouldn't be repeating itself, but the more time passed, the more I didn't want to give my baby the chance. Cue the walking, spicy food, sex, red raspberry leaf tea, dates, squats, uh, I don't know, even a purported labor-inducing gelato from a local shop, which was delicious, by the way. I spent exactly one week doing everything in my power to evict the little bugger. The third feeling, oddly enough, is patience. My water breaking in the wee hours of morning number one of labor set me in a sense of calm that my baby would arrive when they needed to in their own time. Suddenly, I wasn't rushing to have this all over with. Early contractions slowed me down, made me appreciate my baby being just mine all for a little while longer. During my morning appointment with my midwife to get the go ahead for a home birth, I didn't feel nervous that the slow start with ruptured membranes would wind me up with an infection and in hospital. I was confident that sporadic contractions were just teaching me what to expect, giving me a chance to adjust before they ramped up. I went home, I lounged, snacked, and nap the day away, just me, my partner, and my beloved belly, and my two cats. The fourth feeling is tired. Oddly enough, the morning of day number two was the most exhausted I felt in labor. I'm not lying. More than a day had passed since it started, but it seemed nothing had changed. All that discomfort and waiting and lack of sleep was all for nothing. When I returned to my midwife to get a second home birth okay, I lamented that my body, quote, sucked and rambled about a bunch of negative outcomes that I was worried about. She reassured me and suggested a castor oil induction maybe might get things going. Her pep talk and concrete direction was just what I needed to move on to my next feeling. The fifth feeling was energized. <laughs> for anyone who's ever heard of what castor oil can do, I can attest that shit works. I was warned that it would likely cause vomiting, diarrhea, and above all else, give my uterus a nudge into active labor. 
And it did all three of those things just in reverse order. Within an hour in the late afternoon of day two, I had surges four minutes apart lasting one minute each. And I would have them that close together or closer for the remaining 12 hours of labor. I was beyond excited. Between breathing through the waves, I kept shouting to my partner that it was finally happening. He was obviously excited too. As I wrote in the story, he accidentally set our stove on fire in his excitement. The energy was high and only increased with the arrival of my midwife and my beloved doula. It coursed through every part of me, launching me from that scattered, frustrating early labor into the active labor I was looking for that chugged along with me on board for the ride. The energy stayed with me through the evening, overnight and into the morning. It got me through the aforementioned hours of diarrhea and the single most violent vomiting episode I've ever had, one that deserves its own story. Through hours of laboring, room to room, up and down stairs, sitting, standing, all of it grew more and more intense. The sixth feeling was panicked. In the wee hours of day three, I found myself stuck in transition with a cervical lip. Now, the other stories have alluded to the fact that transition can be a bit of a thing. My cervix was entirely dilated except for a small holdout piece that kept baby's head from descending but gave my body the urge to push anyway. This part I'll read directly from the story because I have no other words to describe it. On the next contraction, my midwife told me, I will reach in and try to move the lip. I need you to push as hard as you can. I tried to stick with it, but I hit my limit and I retreated. I began dreading the arrival of every surge. I felt stuck in a painful purgatory. As my body pushed, I couldn't manage to relax, but I could not effectively lean into the pushing. I was battling with my body and it was miserable. Birth as I experienced it is not always idyllic. I had the wherewithal to know at that point that pain medication was out of the cards for me. So I actually asked my midwife, deadpan, if she would kill me. It was that bad. We were able to laugh about it after the fact, but definitely not at the time. I was terrified and at the end of my rope. The seventh feeling is powerful. In a semi-squat, that nasty lip retreated and my baby was locked and loaded. Three contractions, four pushes. That was all it took. It surprised me, but not more than it surprised my team. Up until then, labor had gone relatively slowly, even by first birth standards. After two pushes, I reached down and I felt my baby's head. While this made me feel superhuman, that, that what I thought would be the hardest part of labor was actually the quickest and maybe even the easiest part, dare I say. It set my midwife into a bit of a tizzy. She hadn't yet called the second midwife who was to attend and be called upon as the birth was nearing its end. She ran out of the room while I marveled at this wrinkly head of my baby, who was for a final few precious moments, all mine to cherish. No one else would feel that scrunched up head. No one else would feel her in the way that I got to hold her in the way that I got to. And no one else would feel as powerful as I did in that moment. I savored, savored this before my final surge when her head would fully emerge. I'm going to give you a bit of a hot take that no one asked for. The birth, the actual emergence of the baby, isn't always or even usually the best part of a birth story. I certainly don't feel it is for mine. Like many other vaginal births, I pushed and the baby came out. I'm lucky enough to have suggested to my partner at the time, literally before my final contraction, to take a video. So I have that two minutes that I can revisit whenever I want. But I wish he'd filmed more. I wish he'd filmed the funny sounds I made while laboring that we humorously recount to each other today. I wish he'd filmed my midwife calling my baby he, which explains my shock when my baby was born a female. Filmed my doula's tender touch on my back and my shoulders that I needed so much. Filmed, filmed the damn birth tub being filled and drained and refilled again over and over until the temperature was right. Birth is so much more than just a single moment. And for this story, what can I say other than it happened? And she was there, slow to cry, quick to grasp my finger, the perfect little purple alien I imagined she would be. The eighth feeling is eerie. After the initial energy died down, 
my daughter was comfortably settled on my chest and things got quiet. The marathon was over and the energy of the spectators waned with it. I was consumed by a feeling that maybe only lasted a few minutes, but it's a feeling I haven't spoken about very much. The room was suddenly spooky to me. I was very aware of how dark it was, being only after 5.30 in the morning on the first day of spring. I was self-conscious of the fact that I was head to toe naked in front of three people, two of which had only met me a few times before this event. I was shell-shocked that the little wrinkled thing I held on my chest was now mine to care for for the foreseeable future. Why didn't I feel elated, relieved, something other than the uneasiness that I felt? I delivered the placenta uneventfully, thank goodness, and we, my daughter and I, got out of the tub and onto my bed. The ninth and final feeling is sureness. Our new family of three settled into our queen-size bed Nakedness covered from the three non-family members in attendance, my doula and now the two midwives. We snuggled together and it hit me. I'm this little person's mama. I don't have to be anything other than that. People on the street would someday say to me, congrats, mommy, how old is she? Or family members would wish me a happy Mother's Day as a first time mom. None of that felt right, but none of it mattered. I was this baby's mama. That felt comfortable, it felt natural, and it just fit. I'll have to explain that all to my daughter as she grows up, but for now, she doesn't say much other than, ah, anyway. My favorite moment of all came after the birth of my daughter, after a much needed shower that I nearly fainted in, after a meal that I don't recall eating or what it was comprised of, or even who brought it to me. And after the team all gave their hugs and said their goodbyes. Laying with my daughter on my chest, three hours new, and my partner cuddled up next to me in our bed, we had the best nap in the history of naps. It was restorative, it was peaceful. It filled me with enough love and energy and joy to last the rest of my lifetime, a family nap. And with that, we were set daddy, daughter, and mama. Thank you all so much. I really enjoyed sharing this. Those beautiful reflections. Thank you so much. I'm crying. <laughs> Everyone is crying. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing this with all your heart. It was just perfect, beautiful. Thank you, mama. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the next one and the last one unfortunately jennifer uh the first prize winner she cannot be here today well she wanted to be here at first she said yes i will be there but she's sick she doesn't have a voice anymore she really would like to be here but she said please do read my story so Mitzi accepted to do that. So she's the one who's going to read it. But first, uh, Whitney will introduce, uh, will introduce Jennifer. Hello, everyone. Oh my goodness. Yeah, the tears, the Kleenex, the stories, the sharing. And this is just a special message for Jen as well, who hopefully will be watching the recording. Thank you. Thank you so much for your story. And we celebrate you today. Uh, and we do hope that you recover and get better. Um, so I'm gonna read Jen's bio and then a couple of uh, thoughts that um, I had about the story as well as the other jurors. Um, so Jen Ashton is an award-winning author and a visual artist. Her book of short stories, People Like Frank and Other Stories from the Edge of Normal is shortlisted for the Indigenous Voices Awards. Jen was a teaching assistant in the Simon Fraser University's Writer's Studio and is now studying at the Harbor Graduate School of Education, professor, prof professional education. She is currently the writer in residence at the British Columbia History Magazine. And uh, her story is called Dear Diary, October, 1979. Um, so this story deeply resonates with me. Um, it's compelling. 
It's very different from the others in content, writing style and voice. Dear Diary offers a sense of agency in a situation where there really was not a lot of agency um, in this particular birth story. Uh, many of the stories that we've heard already or some of the stories that we've read um, as a jury featured um, adult mature birthers with supportive spouses and a comprehensive birthing plan. Uh, and this narrator that we meet is young and straightforward, funny and unprepared for the birth that's about to happen all the while hunting for moments of empowerment um, within her own pregnancy, despite the judgmental uh, medical staff and the distant partner. Uh, Dear Diary was such an interesting story in the fact that it, it demonstrates a different type of resiliency. And we as a jury really appreciate the accessibility of language from the voice of a young birther, which resonates with me because there are many young birthers within my family lineage as well. Um, and I think above all through this transition to motherhood, uh, the story that Jen presents to us is somebody who leans on their internal wisdom and sticks to their uh, instincts instead of an exterior knowledge. So with that, I will hand over the microphone for the reading of Dear Diary, October 1979. Thank you, Whitney. Dear Diary, October 1979. Oh. October 1979 entry taken from the diary of the writer. Well, I have a baby and guess what? It's a girl. I couldn't believe it. When the doctor pulled it out and said, it's a girl, I said, what? And he had to say it again because I didn't believe him. I thought for sure it would be a boy. Diary, it was awful. Why doesn't anybody tell you that? Instead of being happy and excited, they should tell you the truth, that it hurts like hell. And afterwards, it feels like you're sitting on a fork. They might as well have pulled my legs off, it hurt so much. Last Saturday night, I woke up and I had a cramp and a sore back. I woke George up and said I had a cramp and I got him to phone us when you're in labor. She should know, she's had four kids and is pregnant with another one. She said it feels exactly like a cramp. So I said, let's go to the hospital. He wasn't very happy about getting out of bed and he asked if I could wait and I said, no. At the hospital, it was okay for a while, but then it really started to hurt and I couldn't stop yelling. They gave me that enema and then it really started to hurt. And they moved the other girl out of the room because I was yelling so much. I was afraid the baby was going to come out when I went to the bathroom after that enema, but they said it wouldn't. But I didn't want it to come out in the toilet, so I put my hand there to hold it in just in case. George didn't want to sit, stay around when I was screaming like that. So he said he was going to go to McDonald's for a burger. I asked the nurse if I could have something to make the pain stop. And she said, no, they shaved all of my hair off down there too. So I was itchy on top of it all. Embarrassing. And people do a lot of things to you, whether you like it or not. It didn't seem fair that nobody listened to what I wanted. I just wanted somebody to rub my back. George did it for a minute, but then he left. It felt so good. I had no idea. It wasn't in any of the books and pamphlets I read. They only talked about, but I didn't have any trouble with that part at all. It just sort of happened. It just sort of happened that way anyhow. Why didn't the midwife say anything? It's an awful way to have babies screaming in pain. It's not perfect and beautiful like on TV. Then I called the nurse because I said I had to push. She said, no, I didn't. And that I sh She went away and another lady came in and said that, that that was it. It was time. George wasn't back from McDonald's yet. And the doctor wasn't there because it was the middle of the night. They took me in my bed to the big operating room and they strapped my legs into the stirrup things and strapped down my arms. I hated that, but they said I had to. Then they put a mirror so I could see what was going on. And when the nurse asked if I could see, I said yes. But George answered too, because he just came back from McDonald's. And suddenly he was standing behind the head of the bed and then they moved the mirror for him. I was mad because I really wanted to see what was going on down there. All I could see now was George's head with a cap and mask on and his crazy, huge, long, frizzy hair sticking out the sides. He looked like a scary clown. 
Then Dr. Kelly ran in and it was a good thing too, because I only pushed three times and then she came out. The nurse kept telling George to push my pillow up to make me sort of sit upright because it would help me, but I kept telling him to stop because it was so annoying. The worst part was being tied down everywhere. I never felt so wildly mad. The doctor made a cut, he said, but he did stitches after the afterbirth came out. That part felt so good. Not the stitches, but the afterbirth, because then it felt like it was really over and the pain finally stopped, finally. It took 23 hours for me to have that baby. They said I had terrible back labor because I was so small and she weighed nearly 10 pounds. Plus I was three weeks late. When I started out before I got pregnant, I was 98 pounds. Last week, I was 148. But I think of it, a lot of it was banana weight. All I wanted to eat the whole time was bananas. But diary, when they put her down beside me, I know my eyes opened so wide because I could not believe that this tiny baby was mine. It was such a strange feeling. I had never seen a baby up close before. I was afraid to touch her. I wanted to just look at her, but they took her away so fast, just when I was getting to know her. She was pink and weary and wearing a funny hat and wrapped up in a yellowy hospital blanket. Her eyes were closed. I could smell that she was mine. We only had boys' names picked out. So after she was born, when we went back to the room and George had a cigarette that he butted it out in, in on his work thermos, work thermos, I said, we had to pick a name. And I picked Melody because we liked music. I told him to go call everybody and tell them, but he didn't want And I said, because they will want to know. And he said, no, they won't. But he went and phoned my mom anyway. There's a part of him that just doesn't care about anything, especially about being a dad. I remember that George told me that his family used to have chocolate pudding for supper on Sundays. And I think it was a way to bribe him and his sisters to go to church. Maybe that's still the way he works, but I don't have anything left to offer. The next day, there was an exercise class in the waiting room for all the mothers, and I felt embarrassed because I didn't have a bathrobe to wear. We did sit-ups, and the teacher nurse said that we would go back to our schoolgirl figures. And then he looked at me and laughed and said, well, some of us. I thought that was mean. I think they all thought I was too young to have a baby. But I think 15 years old is just right. I sure wished I had a bathrobe and slippers and not just the old flannel nightgown that used to be my mom's with the buttons that always fly open in front. All the other ladies there look nice in their velour bathrobes. My grandma brought me a purple one like that once. I wished I'd had it, but I didn't know where it was. I walked up and down the halls with the baby when, when the baby was asleep. Lots of pregnant ladies were just walking up and down the halls with their husbands holding their hands. Some were even smiling. I didn't hear anybody else yelling. I felt really dumb. I hope nobody knew it was me making all that noise yesterday. The nurse came in to show me how to feed her, but I was already doing it. So she said, oh, I see you already are. And then she left. She was kind of snotty. And I noticed that they didn't smile much around here. The girl in the bed across from me let me use her Polaroid camera to take a picture of me with the baby. I showed it to George, but he didn't seem to care too much. I said, we should get one of those Polaroid cameras so we can take some pictures too, but I don't think he wants to. My dad gave me his nice camera a long time ago when I was taking photography in school, but we had to pawn it when he got to town for gas and food. Diary, I had to stay in the hospital until my stitches down there were gone. And they made me lay with a big hot light under the covers to help them dry up. The baby was living in the nursery. I asked the nurse what they would feed her if she woke up. And they said a bit of sugar water. And I didn't think that sounded very good. I asked why she couldn't stay with me because I can feed her myself like I'm supposed to. After that, they gave me my own room so I could help her all the time and feed her through the night. They wheeled her in and her bed was sort of clear, a sort of clear plastic thing on top of a trolley. A nurse came in and said she was going to show me how to go to the bathroom. I had no idea what she was talking about. But when I got out of bed, a huge gush of blood splashed out all over the floor. I was really scared, but she said that was okay. It was normal. And then she took me to the bathroom and buzzed for a cleaner to come. 
She told me to pee and then she showed me how to fill up a cup with soapy water and rinse myself off of it. It sort of stung on my stitches, but afterwards it felt better. Then she showed me how to pin this huge pad in my underwear to catch the blood next time. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, they used Melody for the baby model when they showed how to wash a baby. We all went into another girl's room and they had a baby bath there and we all sat around the bed and watched. I said, that's my baby. As soon as I recognized her, it was a funny feeling recognizing her. She really is perfect and looks like the baby on the diaper box. I was happy that I knew how to do everything they said and I couldn't wait to hold her. I wonder if she knew she was mine or if they just grabbed the most perfect one they could find for this lesson. I went up afterwards and said she was mine, but they had already wrapped her up and were taking her back to the nursery. I wasn't sure about these strange rules about hospitals and babies. And when I finally, and when I would finally get her to myself. After it was all over and I was laying under the covers with that stupid heat lamp pointed at me, I remembered talking with Jules and some other girls at school who said that women in China gave birth in rice paddies and put the baby on their backs and kept one working. I guess I should be thankful that I'm here, warm and safe in hospital, even though they did tie me up. Just to say the Polaroid is attached to the story on the website if anyone wants to go see it themselves. Um, and I think that completes our readers for today. And um, we now are honored with the most amazing um, um, performance by Kim June Johnson. Uh, Kim, uh, Kim June Johnson is a singer songwriter, storyteller and poet currently living and working in the Comox Valley. When there's no global pandemic, Kim tours with her cellist, uh, Jordy Robinson, performing house concerts and at folk clubs. Their shows often incorporate live poetry. Her songs have won multiple awards and she mentors songwriters one on songwriter's path. A recent graduate of Simon Fraser University, the Writer's Studio, her poems have appeared in Prairie Fire Room, CV2 and ARC Poetry Magazine. She is currently at work on material for a new album a memoir about her postpartum depression, and a collection of flash essays. She lives in a droughty house near a creek with her teen daughters. She's posts, poems, music, and other things on her Instagram page, instagram.com slash Kim June Johnson. She will now perform a song called Nearly As Tall As Me. Thank you so much. Hello. Wow. Thank you so much for that. The honor of being... Um, able to listen to all those beautiful stories. I didn't, I came into this not having a clue how lovely and beautiful and literary it's, it was going to be. So thank you for that gift today. Um, I'll skip the, the chit chat. And um, this is, I have two daughters and um, my first daughter um, swept me into a world where suddenly I was so just blasted with the fact of how everything just kept changing and changing and and it just continued to do so. And that was, that's probably been the, the, uh, the big, you know, learning curve for me as a mother. Um, so this is called nearly as tall as me. And I wrote this for my, my firstborn's 12th birthday. She was born on a sunny morning in May. And I still remember the way the light played On the sheets of the bed and her brand new skin And I knew everything would be different then We brought her home to our little house Showed her around and told her about All the beautiful things that she'd get to see stars and snowfalls and apricot trees and now she's nearly as tall as me and she moves so fast you can barely see her so i look real close and take my time lord knows the years have a way of rolling by
cut her hair for the very first time on the front steps in late July. And I watched the wind come through the trees and it blew those pieces wherever it pleased. She learned to walk under those same trees and now she walks away from me to her school up the road and to things I don't know. Now she's nearly as tall as me And she moves so fast you can barely see her So I look real close and take my time Lord knows the years have a way of rolling by Rolling by Rolling by she is dancing in her dance class. There she is riding her horse through a field. She was born on a sunny morning in May, and I still remember the light that day. Thank you. That was lovely. I'm crying Thank you all over so much. <laughs> yeah, it brings up all the emotion that we went through this <laughs> during the old circle. It's uh, thank you very much. Wonderful. Um, I yeah, I guess I should have the last word since. Uh, um, I think for me, uh, the, the bird sharing circle every year is my big reward for the work I put. In making this happening and uh, well I was well served today um oh, I'm very emotional um, um that was really wonderful thank you so much everybody for sharing your stories I have many people to thank first of all all the jurors and the right and the the readers who uh, did all this on a volunteer basis and they really were dedicated. They read every story with lots of interest and uh, just and heart. Um, I also want to thank everybody who participated today, uh, who came with the uh, open art and shared your story with uh, so much honesty. And I also want to thank every people who send a story. I just want to underline that we're, every, every story seems so important. We would like to give a prize to everybody. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's a gift. Every story that we receive is received like a gift. Um, yeah. Um, so really, the, it's the circle that keep me going every year uh, because it's such a it's such a gift to listen to all your story. It's one thing when we receive the story, but when we when you present them, when you read it, it's uh, it's so moving, and uh, the solidarity that it brings together to is uh, is really something that we want to develop in maternity care. So that's the idea of the circle too. Um, oh, I'm so emotional. <laughs> um, so to keep it going, well, I have to ask for volunteers so I cannot keep doing this alone or with just a little team. So anyone who feels that uh, this is important, uh, please send me an email. You can reach me through doulasupport.org. We need plenty of people to make this work, whether you have skills in PR, grant education, writing, uh, webmasters, coordinating, graphic design, editing, book proposal writing, outreach, advocacy, there's space for many talents in the team. Um, I have a vision where this could go uh, that I won't share completely here today, but uh, instead of a contest, we want to change this into uh, 
uh, writing development program where we have we can pay writers to mentor new writers to writing bird stories and other stories around around parenting so that's what we have in in store right now for next year and ideally what i would like is to do it in english in french and indigenous languages which is very very uh optimistic maybe but that's the goal the ultimate goal and um yeah so that's where it's going i think and um so i just want to thank you all um i'm afraid this is the end uh i have to say goodbye and i really i, I mean thank you everybody to make this event so beautiful and so uh, heartwarming um yeah, that's Zoom, so I hugged you all. <laughs> Thank you very much for all of this. This was great. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, everyone, Julia. for joining. It was lovely. What a beautiful experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We're so, so grateful. <sighs> okay, well. So we'll see. Recording. We'll say see you next year, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bye, Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye for now. <laughs> Thanks again. Bye, everyone. Bye.